Hi, thanks very much. Um, so I'm Stephen Bristol. I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, teaching Rails, teaching Ruby, the community. Um, I'm going to let these fine gentlemen go down the line and um, introduce themselves. And um, if you could say your name and why you're part of this panel, like justify your existence for us <laughs> briefly. Cool. I'm Steve Anderson. Bendy Works sprang into existence partly as a side effect of uh, mentoring and teaching other people. Uh, thanks to Eric Knapp, who's in the audience someplace out here, I've taught five semesters at uh, the Tech College here in town and uh, try to set up a, an environment for success. And you can't do that with setting it up for teaching and mentoring and lots of learning. So along with, with the five semesters at um, a university, you guys are also doing apprenticeship type programs in-house? Um, we do, we, one of the programs we do is we sell our services that we work on a customer's code in combination with leveling up their developers on their own code base. Okay. Chad? I'm Chad Patel, I'm the CEO of ThoughtBot, and we run a program called Apprentice.io. And that is a three-month-long, one-on-one uh, apprenticeship program. Um, this year, we have 20 apprentices. Um, it's a big expansion of our internal apprentice program, which had, we had been doing for two years. We also give uh, Rails and Ruby workshops, two-day workshops all over. Um, and uh, yeah. How often do you give workshops? Uh, we give the intro to Ruby. Uh, Intro to Ruby on Rails workshop once a month, and the other workshops are about one, every one and a half months. And they're all in your location in Boston? Or you Actually, know, Boston and San Francisco. And, San Francisco. and, uh, and soon to be in Europe. And uh, your apprenticeship program is three months, and you have people in it all the time, and you run them concurrently? Yeah, so it's not classes. It's not batches of people. Mm -hmm. when you, once you're accepted in the program, over 250 people have applied. Once you, we've accepted 20 for this year. So once you're accepted, you're scheduled into a slot with a mentor. And so unfortunately, the demand has been such that some people are waiting until all the way actually uh, January of 2013. Um, and it's very interesting for those people because they're, they're going to quit their job and do it. So it's been a little trickier for them to uh, schedule that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Uh, I'm Jeff Cohen. I'm an instructor at Code Academy in Chicago. Uh, we run 11 week long web development and web design courses. Um, sort of how I got there was a long time developer doing mod.net. Uh, 2005, began to learn about Ruby, switched over to Rails. Co-author of a book called Rails for .NET Developers. 2008, I began to teach on the side, so I would go to corporate organizations where they've got Java developers or .NET developers who wanted to learn how to switch over. So I'd show up for a day or two and do that. Found out that what I really enjoyed was the beginners, not the advanced folks. <laughs> and so Code Academy was a chance to do beginner-focused education, which is my passion. So you do uh, 11 weeks, and then you do another 11 weeks, and then you do another 11 weeks. Exactly. We're almost, we've got two weeks left in what will now be our fourth quarter in existence. And how many kids do you have in each class? We have um, about 22 to 24 in the web dev class. We actually now run two sections of the web dev class. We, in our evening design classes, we have about 30 in each class. And by kids, I mean folks. Yes, All ages, exactly. right? Yeah. It's hard not to call them kids. Yeah, um, that's right. Jeff? Uh, so my name is Jeff Kasmer. I started a company called Jumpstart Lab, which you may, may have heard mentioned 12 times, I think, so far this conference. <laughs> Mission accomplished. No one else counted. Uh, no one else counted. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I have a little tally. And, um, so 2000, well, I started uh, teaching computer science with Teach for America in 2003, um, started Jumpstart Lab in 2009, and taught primarily kind of the, the, the classes Jeff was talking about, the travel corporate um, classes, three days to two weeks kind of thing. Um, most recently, we started Hungry Academy at Living Social um, as a I mean, partnership kind of with Living Social. Uh, started in March with 24 people uh, who were not Ruby developers, 16 of them identified as non-developers, eight had a development background, uh, and then at the end of July, after five months of, you know, startup style hours, 70 hour week kind of thing, um, they were all true developers and were hired to the Living Social Engineering team. Awesome. Um, 
Steve, when, with your, uh, you're not doing the, the teaching at the university currently, that's right? Not at the moment. So with the, the, the people that come in, you say they're primarily, they work for your clients. Is that right? Uh, okay, well, you were asking if we do apprenticeship. We have a much less, in, less formal approach. Everyone that we hire into Bendy Works, we have them go through a period of leveling up. And we did a really interesting program last year uh, that was based on something Hash Rocket did where we had one uh, person, it was myself, and th our three newest people. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, focused on leveling up. We set up a project who is real customer work and you know real goals. And But the focus, it was a cheaper rate and a longer period of time, so the focus would be on Right. Sharing the habits, how we do things at Bendy Works, mm -hmm. and it worked really well. Uh, we switched pairs twice a day so that um, no person and no bit of code was ever more than four hours or so away from uh, involvement with with the senior person. Okay, worked really well. Yeah. we're gonna next time we do it, we're gonna twist it a little bit though, and just have two new people. In. So then, so then, you, these are your employees. So they get a salary. Yeah. They get a salary. And yes. Chad, the the people who come on board for the apprenticeship, you pay them or they pay you? Uh, we pay them. <laughs> <laughs> we pay them five hundred dollars a week. So it's six thousand dollars over the course of three months. Three, three months. And, and we do not bill out their time. So okay. they're working. Um, we pay them, but they are doing work. Um, that's non non billable unpaid. time. Yeah. And uh, the people that come to your workshops, they pay you. Yeah. And Jeff, the people that come to your workshops, they pay. They do. And you don't have any sort of internship program or something where you're paying people to learn. No, we're not primarily interested in job placement. Mm -hmm. It's for people who want to learn about what web development is all about, people who have really no background in it at all, mm -hmm. wanting to get a taste of it. And Jeff, how, how are your structure for? Uh, um, we're kind of on both sides. So with Hungry Academy, it was a fully paid program. They were paid very well uh, during the program and then Do you want to say how well? Uh, quite well. I, I thought <laughs> too, too well. Um, what uh, <laughs> not that well. Not no that one's well. paid that well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, were, they were paid what I would consider a very reasonable developer salary during the program and then transitioned into a good developer salary after the program. So um, along those lines then, at what level did they come out? Did they come out at that? What level? In skill? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in skill, it was it was my goal that they w could be called developers. Um, you know, some some of the conversation around these issues. Uh, there's another program that uses the phrase "world class beginner," and I, I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. phrase. And I didn't want to make up any phrases for our people. I wanted them to just be developers, and, and we accomplished that goal. Um, would you have hired any of the 24 at the salary that they're Absolutely. paying? Absolutely. Yeah, so, <laughs> I so would, if I, if I, if Chad wouldn't have strangled me, I would have hired about eight of them. Chad different Powell, Chad, different Chad. Yeah, Chad, Chad, Chad. Yeah. Well, we tried to get another Chad for the panel. <laughs> yeah, but, um, get more Chad. Depends on how this panel goes. Um, I, I would say that the, the top third or so are, are, they know a lot of things I don't know. And did they, um, are they required to take a, the position with Living Social? Uh, there was a, a uh, it was communicated that if, Living Social offered you an acceptable position. It was expected that you were going to take it. Right, but obviously contractually, they can't, right. can't force you to take it. Right, in the U.S., you know, right to work and so right. forth. People can be fired anytime, and you right. can quit your job anytime. And Chad, with you, what about the people that come out of your apprenticeship? Are they required, or do you encourage them to take a position with you? We encourage them to take a position. Well, what we actually do is we encourage them to take an interview with us. You know, obviously, they've been interviewing with us for three months, sure. but with any of the employers. So the way that we can do so many apprentices is that Anyone who we don't hire gets the opportunity to interview with over 100 apprentices who are watching them come through the three-month apprenticeship. And when that happens, we get a placement fee for that. Okay. And uh, it actually hasn't. It's only happened once. And Stephen, obviously, they're already your employees, so that's yes. not an issue. Um, when, Chad, when they come out of your program, what level would you expect them to be? It, it, it depends on where they came in mm -hmm. at. Uh, we generally talk about them going up one whole level, so beginner to intermediate or intermediate to expert. And, uh, and that's what we, but our goal over time has evolved as it become, as the economics of the program become clear, where our goal is we want to get everyone to the point where ThoughtBot would hire them. 
And if we can do that, that then we'll be really successful. Mm -hmm. And how, how have you done in reaching that goal? Uh, we've hired, so, so far this year, um, we've done 12 apprentices. We've hired six of them. And did you not hire the other six because of level or because it just wasn't a good fit? Or they, For they a were... bunch of different reasons. So okay. some people, uh, actually so people, two the, people the, the went off. The question off. really is people are coming out of the program all at that high level. Yeah, yeah. Two people went off and did their own startup together. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple were students. So they, they were so strong that we accepted them knowing that they were going to go back to school and wouldn't become available for another year. Um, and, and others, um, you know, it wasn't a good fit for consulting mm -hmm. or, or something like that. And, and Stephen, when, when people, uh, you're hiring people, are you hiring them at, at an instructor level, at a beginner level, at an intermediate level, and then? We've hired people at, at a broad range. Uh, the key is passion. Uh, the group of three that I was talking about, each of those had, two of them had a Rails app in production already, and one had a Python app in, mm -hmm. in production. Uh, but I don't think any of the three had yet done test-driven development, behavior-driven development, and iteration. And Jeff, when people are coming, obviously your course is only 11 weeks, so it's considerably, it's a bit shorter. Um, how, what level are they coming in and out of your program? So they're coming in, most of our students have never tried to do any programming at all. Uh, I tell people that if you can use a keyboard and a mouse, you're good to go. Um, coming out, um, most people are just short of trying to get an apprenticeship, mm -hmm. so we try to connect them in with the community that we have in Chicago to usually people will find bridges toward learning what they need to do next. A few people have found apprenticeships and found jobs, but the rule, that's the exception. Most folks are coming to actually take the skill back to their job that they already have mm -hmm. to apply it to their industry. I see. Yeah. Um, so how do you guys define beginner, intermediate, and senior expert developer? Like, Where, where do you guys draw the line, those lines? <laughs> right, like well, let's start with it, Chad. So I define um, an intermediate Rails developer as someone who is able to completely generate a Rails app on their own, um, but doesn't uh, do it with purpose or craftsmanship. So that, that's the difference. That's uh, so, intermediate. Yeah. Um, is anyone else shocked by that? Am I the only one? A couple. Go on. So that, that um, so when I say things, I mean like do, uh, writing tests, doing TDD, being able to oh, look so at code. Oh, so not just generate a Rails app, but actually like make a Rails app. Yeah, build the whole oh, Rails yeah, app. Just, yeah, yeah. I'm not so shocked anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, but doesn't you know doesn't look at code and know necessarily why it's good or bad. But can't talk about it that way and doesn't know how to make it better. Mm -hmm. And then advanced would be someone who can do all of that. All of it. Yeah. And is there a difference between advanced and expert or senior? Or that those three words are all synonymous. I, yeah, I, I, um, I tend not to use the word like expert too much because I think real experts don't won't say that they're experts that because they understand how much they don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jeff. Yeah, if I can morph your question a little bit into something else, something. Um, the evolution that I tend to see over the eleven weeks that we have is that beginners will come in looking for the recipe. Like, okay, what, what do I type next? After I do the Rails new, you know, we get around to models, okay, what do I do? They're looking for the recipe. By the end, it's a little bit more intuition based. Oh yeah, I need a couple of models, I need to do it as many, and they sort of go, so they sort of leave, they let go of that worry about recipe, and they're building more based on their intuition and feel about what to do next. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit hard to categorize, but there's usually a point at which you feel like someone has moved into that more intermediate level when they can stop worrying about syntax so much. They're, they're comfortable, oh, you know what, I can go look it up if I need to. They don't worry about memorizing. They've learned how to go read and apply what they're reading into, into what they can do, sort of on their own. So mm -hmm. they've sort of learned how to learn. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, my hope by the end of the 11 Weeks of Code Academy is that the students don't say, okay, well, that was pretty good. I can now forever do whatever Jeff taught me for 11 weeks. I want them to be able to say, okay, that was pretty good, but now I'm good to go. Like, now I really can start to build my app. Mm -hmm. See ya. <laughs> that, that's when I know that, that they've actually accomplished what I, what I would like. Yeah. So, so that, yeah. I think that, I think the intermediate developer can solve problems. They can find a solution to a problem, right? And then, kind of as Chad was saying, like, the, the 
beyond intermediate, it's hard to say advanced, right? But like the, the upper intermediate or proficient developer can find multiple solutions and evaluate those solutions and refine them along mm -hmm. the way. How, how percentage-wise, how often is the intermediate developer who's finding that solution, is that, is that a good solution or a solution that you guys have come up with or put into production? I feel like you can always hate code. Well, I mean, let's not get to that level, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, an intermediate level isn't taking Paulo's talk from this right. morning and finding how to get around it, right? Yeah, like, I work with Steve, so, like, I'm accustomed to every piece of Steve code Cowboy. you've ever seen. Cowboy. Cowboy. Like, Steve wait, Steve. what about? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the first time it's always bad, right? So uh, part, part of the challenge of this, is in, in all these processes, we're trying to compress the learning of years, like none of us learn this in, in three months, six months, nine months, whatever. Uh, and the part you can't replicate is just doing it a lot. You know, you just have to go through it and solve problems, mm -hmm. even similar problems several times over. And so I think if you can get your first couple bad solutions out of the way under like a controlled environment where you have a lot of support, then you're set up to build the good solution. May I speak, yeah. may I speak to that? So the thing that works so effectively uh, towards that issue is pair programming. And pair programming is such a powerful mechanism for transfer of knowledge, transfer of skills, um, approach. You know, an intermediate working with an expert is going to be learning new things that are the next step for them as an intermediate and be exposed to things that are advanced concepts all mixed together and they're getting what they're able to get out of it all the, the all, every day they're going to get different things out of that situation. Yeah. I think one of the challenges there is the expert has to know how to let the other person struggle. You know, it's it's difficult, I think especially for us like when you see the solution it's like okay, tag, I got this and it's done, you know. And it's not also you can't go to the other extreme of like I'm not telling you. I'm just going to sit here and like, <laughs> right? And, and so that's where it takes the practice and, you know, having... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say, I mean, the, on, on, what, Thursday, I sat through your um, day of uh, Rails Ruby training, and I was really impressed by your ability to walk that line, and I thought that was, I was very impressed by that. Um, what's a developer worth? How do you value a developer? Like, like, like you got a guy or a gal out of school or... Um, you know, interviewing, how do you put a price on them? What, what's that value? How do you do that? You mean how do you make a salary for that? I mean, person? how do you do it? How does Chad do it? How do, how do the Jeps do it, Steve? How do you guys do it? What, what, what's your thought process? What goes into that? How do, you, how do you take someone that you don't know and then put a price tag on them? The variances in salary at ThoughtBot in the grand scheme of things are, there's very little variance. And most variances come from people's, like, what they've made before and, the, and their, what they need to live, because they might have a family or, or those kinds of things. That, so you're saying there's not a great variance. Yeah. Right, but, that, but you're generally hiring or exclusively hiring very high-level uh, engineering right. developers, right? Right. So that might explain that variance, but that's yeah. not really what I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, like, in... in in Living Social, and obviously I, I do not work at Living Social, just to be clear, so I can't speak authoritatively. Um, but what Chad talks about there is that he needs developers when you, you, we think about salary, right? And like, that's how much I cost is my salary. But practically speaking, from a business perspective, it's much more than that. And you need a developer to deliver value about 3x their salary. You know, and our salaries are large. So it's, you know, you're talking, you're, you're, you're probably above 200, somewhere between 200 and 300,000 a year of value. So I would think, like, is that the kind of scale you guys have as consultants? Yeah. So we we know what our what, what we need, what the economics of our business are, and so we can't pay someone outside of those economics. Mm -hmm. Particularly because we're not a product company. So if we stop working, the money stops. Um, so if someone's not generating that that value of being able to effectively, uh, we don't have different levels of rates for individual consultants at ThoughtBot. So. You need to be able to bill at our high rate, and if you're not able to do that, then then you don't work at Thoughtbot. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what I what we always do, and the way we're structured is uh, that the value uh, that you bring to the company has almost nothing to do. Once you, if you're meeting the baseline of doing great development, your projects are going well, all that stuff, 
how we actually value you is, um, is by the, the other stuff that you do. So instigating change, starting new open source projects, coming up with new ideas for improvement, and those kinds of things. So we do quarterly reviews and give people raises every quarter. Based on that? On the, those, those other values, metrics, those yeah. Values. yeah. Um, but surely in, in your apprenticeship programs and in your teaching programs, uh, you have students that come to you and say, you know, based on what you've seen me, you know, towards the end of the program, based on what you've seen for me so far, what can I, what should I be asking for? Yeah. So how do you come up with those numbers? Like, what? Um, more. And, and they surely you had to, always more. Yeah, so a lot of the people who come into the program have been taken mm -hmm. advantage of. That, you know, they don't really know not what they're, no, yeah, not by us. Right. They don't really know what the, they are worth. In case you were wondering. So yeah. the reason why a lot of people are willing to quit their job and, and come uh, work with us to do this is because, you know, they're either just out of school or a couple years out of school. They're making like $45,000 a year doing something that they don't really like and isn't progressing them. Mm -hmm. And so someone like that who comes in at a beginner and leaves as an intermediate developer, uh, in the Boston area would make uh, like 75 or 85 to start. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I, based on market and all that stuff, that's where I would counsel that, that person to be at and to expect. I think it, it's good that you mentioned market because uh, we have, <clears throat> I'll say almost half of our students are from outside of Illinois, some from outside the country. So sometimes I'll get this question, what, what can I make? So, well, I don't know, you're going to stay in Chicago because the Chicago rates are not the same as San Francisco mm -hmm. or, or New York or somewhere else. So it's also market dependent. You got San Francisco, New York, like Boston, D.C., Denver, Boulder, and then Chicago and everywhere else, right? So mm -hmm. I think when you're looking at a beginner, like an apprentice, depending what kind of support um, a person's getting, I would expect them to earn like 50 mm -hmm. to 60 area kind of area, maybe up to 65. I think uh, a proficient developer is going to be in like the 60, upper 60s, like 67 to like 80, 85. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, and with two years seasoning, you're like 85 up to 110. Kind of right. Yeah, that's that matches my expectation. So too. just by a round of applause, do you guys tend to agree with these numbers from what you've seen and feel, or do you think they're kind of off? So let's applaud if you think they're they're kind of on spot on. I, w I was saying kind of like the one I'm familiar with, which is which is like the DC, Boulder, Boston, you mm -hmm. know, like San Francisco. Do you guys kind of agree with that? I would guess that Madison a little bit lower. So that's pretty hit and miss, I'd say. Um, I mean, or was I wrong? I mean, was that a lot? I mean, it seemed like like kind of medium to me. Um, but th so let, let's turn that question around then, right? So as an employer. Right, which some of you guys are, are, are that as well, and people are coming into you, how do you then evaluate them to figure out what category they're in, right? Um, and, and, and turning that around again, how does then that individual, how do they prove that to you, right? So let's say they didn't go through this apprenticeship program yeah. where you have some experience and this is someone, how, how, do you, how do they prove to you what they can do? Yeah. Uh, so our process for hiring is non-technical discussion interview with me, Mm -hmm. uh, a technical interview with one or two of the developers lasts an hour. We just ask you some questions and talk about your experience. And if you pass that tech, oh, sorry. The first thing we do before ever talking to you is we ask to review your code. So uh, we do not talk to, like we don't even really talk to anyone who we don't already know uh, without reviewing code first. And we started doing that because we would talk to people and they would talk a really good game and then we'd eventually get to see their code, and we're like, we should have just never, we never should have talked to this person. Mm -hmm. um, so we started reviewing code up front. Um, but some people so don't have any code to show because they're either they're new or they just basically. Do right. So then we're not, they're not a candidate for a full for position at Thoughtbot. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is there, Stephen? Do you have a, other? Well, we're still young enough in our growth. Um, We've never hired anybody we're not excited about already, and what we do is we. So these are people you're to, familiar with. To yes, get right. We set up. We help support and grow the community, and every now and then people stand out from the community, mm -hmm. and we try to set up uh, opportunities to do projects with those people, pair program. But certainly, we try to pair program with them. Yeah, so not to. So then, if you make it through the technical interview, you do a day of pairing, right? Where you come in, you pair with two or three members of the team for the day. 
and give a presentation to the whole company at the end of the day. Uh, so everyone gets to see you talk and, and, and get exper experience of you. And so as someone who, who maybe both hires but certainly puts um, people out in the world, do you feel that some sort of certification or something might be appropriate, a good idea? No. No. No, <laughs> no not at all. So I, I, I have like uh, what I know is an unpopular position on this, which is yes, um, or that I, I think it's really interesting. From my background in education, like when you're, uh, when we would tell someone you're teaching seventh grade social studies, like there's a list of skills that a person who finishes seventh grade social studies is supposed to uh, possess, the, the standards. And now we have common core standards, but uh, I, I think it's very interesting that as a Ruby developer, I, it's impossible. I'm not so interested in other people telling me what I know, but for me, I can't express what I know about Ruby or what are specifically the things I don't know. There's no way for me to like run down a list and figure out like here are the 116 things I feel awesome at, here are the 40 things I'm decent at, and here are the 30 things that Paulo was talking about this morning that I don't know anything about. You know, I did know some of them, but uh, you know, how, how do you? That's no, not true. Uh, I, I think it would be interesting and probably valuable if the community started to drive a discussion about like what it means to be a Ruby developer. Right. I think a lot of the rejection of certifications that the community has is like no one and I would welcome anyone who has, no one has a good example of a certification that the community thinks is a good example of a yeah. certification in like really any <laughs> industry, maybe plumbers ha like have licenses or whatever. So I think if someone were, to, sorry? Yeah, I don't even, I don't even know, um, but yeah. Well, they all have like well, a degree, right? In those for professionals. So you were saying like the bar exam for attorneys, right? But does would people hold that up as an example of wow, that's a really great way of doing it? And would you guys want to take one just because these guys introduced one, right? Uh, to prove that what you already know, right? Right. Which is the flip side of that, right? Of the certification. Yeah. Like who who's going to do that? Right. Right. I, and so my my thinking on it, um, you know. The Stockholm or not Stockholm syndrome, um, imposter syndrome <laughs> came up yesterday. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think. Sigmund is listening. Thank you. Uh, I, I think even good developers, there's like a tinge of doubt in your gut that maybe you're not that good of a developer, um, and I wonder if part of our reaction to certification isn't a concern that like someone's going to find out I'm a fraud and that I'm actually not that good a developer. So let's ask somebody that doesn't have that, that tinge. Anthony, do you want to? Um... <laughs> oh, I have that tinge every day. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't. So when, he doesn't. when you look at code that you wrote a, a week ago, though, you see all the problems with it, and you realize, even, even just a week, I know how to do something sure. better than I did before. I think that's another concern with certifications, is like, how can you possibly keep it up to date yeah. Especially in the kind of environment that we operate in, where are you going to certify that like, people know certain gems? Well, like, you know, like sure. what, the, what the fad is for testing is not like a measure of what someone is good at. So whether they know our spec or right testing. now, I feel like we have kind of a de facto certification where mm -hmm. you know if somebody came to me, I was hiring a developer, and you say they're good, I'm like, oh, the chapters are good, they're good. So they yeah. did the Patel certification. Right, know. but but. But you guys are kind of ruining that, right? By by cranking out Rails yeah. developers, right? You're you're creating a, a world where you don't know people, and that's that's kind of what started um, or what could lead to like needing recruiters, heaven forbid, if you guys are very successful. Well, so I, I think that the best way to demonstrate what you know is to show something you've built. Yes. So that's do why you, I think you, you guys right. look at your get, get up do you, do you encourage your students to build something in, over the course or, or immediately after? Is that part of? They can't come in unless they have something they need to build. So that's I, I interesting. Don't, I don't think that a, come in, you should try to acquire skills just so you can mm -hmm. get a salary. That, if you have a meaningful problem and you actually want to solve, then you'll be motivated to go through the hard work of one of these programs that's gonna to take to actually get through the whole program. Mm -hmm. You need something that you are really passionate about. You're willing to work a lot and try to learn a lot and keep going even when things get tough. 
Because you have a higher goal. Um, if so, I think that the goal-based learning is really the the important thing. I think, like Seema said, like you need to have something that they're working on, something that's a meaningful mm -hmm. um, part of work. So, I think that most employers these days are just looking at, well, what have you what have you built? I think right. the, the the GitHub profiles become the resume. <laughs> yes, I, I think that um, that's absolutely right for for like traditional employers and, and companies like like ours, but. Um, I know Jeff was trying to do some stuff with the with veterans, yes. and we've also explored that a little bit. Um, and that's where you get into like, well, if people go through your program, how are you like, what do they get out of it? Yeah. So what what Chad's alluding to, we, we had the conversation with like the Veterans Administration, uh, mm -hmm. those kinds of veterans, uh, about funding, you know, workforce development training. Yeah. And so the first question they ask is, when they get done, what what certification are they going to have? And when the answer is like, well, we don't really believe in certification, they're like, hmm, fantastic, get out, you know. Uh, <laughs> but for that, you could just say, well, they get the Jumpstart Lab certification. Yeah. The certified Ruby developer, right? You could just. All right, but the risk is, is if he does, if he does that, then the community tears him apart. Yeah. Like that's not gonna would do you, anyone any good. Yeah. Would you? Does, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. If, he, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. if he created a certification of completion, you guys would frown on that? No. <laughs> a lot. Uh, right. <laughs> but, but okay. So, but overwhelmingly, would you guys like if it's just a certification of completion? Do you guys feel threatened by that? Do you feel like that's okay? Do you feel like that's sliding? Uh, it's too much of a slippery slope already. The reason. Sure, but it matters to the, the government agency and the people that he's trying to help, right? So it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, that's the problem, right? Is that all that that says is that you take the money. Yeah, uh, right. Not necessarily, right? It, it, no, would you, would someone, I mean, somebody could come in and learn nothing. Is it possible that someone's going to finish one of your courses and learn nothing and not be qualified when they come out? Like, like how, how do you guys, like, how well, do you guys do so, that? So, so not for his, but if cert certification becomes the norm, then somebody else could fool the government agency that they have a certificate, which will mean nothing. Well, they don't mean nothing. The reason it's I'm against it. Is, well, exactly, that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think we should conform <laughs> to, <laughs> like, I think we're forgetting that there's a thing called a computer science degree, which is supposed to right, actually but that's indicate, pretty meaningless, too. It is. So I, I, let's all do computer science. Right. 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 You don't know that. Yeah. Right. I mean, in no. theory, in theory, you do. Be aware. You don't know. Generally. But she doesn't call a certified plumber. She calls a plumber for the phone book. Right. Yeah. So, so, so let, let, let's, bring, let's bring this back for a quick second. I appreciate your input. I do. I want to add one thing. Yeah. I'm against certification because of personal experience. As a Java consultant, I worked with people who scored 100% on the Sun certified Java exams, and they could not code their way out of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. yes. Sure, sure. I'm not for it either. All right. We're, yeah. Right. Okay. So, yes, Anthony. So, for all the people that are saying no to certification, I'm curious: have have you looked at what it takes to get certification in other professions? Because I can't mm -hmm. speak to it, so I don't say yes or no. Has yeah. anybody who's poo pooing it actually looked at what it takes to become a certified plumber or a certified teacher? So, so let's let's just everyone answer that question for yourselves internally and continue yeah. that conversation. <laughs> <after>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and after you do it, show me the receipt. We're, we're almost out of time here, so I want. I want. <laughs> I was certified in Amsterdam, but not for this. He has the Patel um, stamp of approval. All right, so um, just a few a few quick questions. Um, what's your favorite thing about the other people and, and groups on the on the panel, and perhaps your least favorite thing? 
I love the fact that these guys are focused on teaching exclusively. It's their primary focus. Or, Except or for Chad. That, well, Chad, he's brought his apprentice program. He's developed that and pushed it uh, through several iterations. Yeah, and actually, one of, one of the reasons why we give it a separate name is so that it is a standalone thing that is can be focused on. So we have a, I used to do it. We now have someone else who is the product manager for that business unit, and we generate a P&L for that and, and all that stuff, too. So. Mm -hmm. I really like how Apprentice.io has figured out a way to have people work on real projects without there being, there's no like danger or subterfuge to the client. Apprentice.io is ThoughtBot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I actually like about ThoughtBot is just the contribution back to the community. I mean, it's one of the things, when I was a long time at .NET Dev, and then open source seemed like, what? You work for free and you just give away? This is crazy. That's evil. Dark side. So. But actually now that I, it didn't take me long to figure out well, like, what a wonderful place open source is. The fact that you, there's almost an expectation that if you're going to use something that you got out of the open source community, you're almost expected to give something back. I think ThoughtBot has been, been awesome. Is there something um, that you might be too scared to, to try or to do that you like, oh, I would love to do this, but I, I really, I'm not courageous enough. I don't want, want to risk that. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing called certification. <laughs> um, well, the, the thing we tried to do that we had to pull back from was we, was we ran into a whole bunch of stuff with visas. So, you know, Ashish talked about this. The, the reality is there is no visa that the U.S. has that allows someone to do, to come to the U.S. and do one of these things, anything that we do. Um, um, like, you need to be, all the visas you have, it needs to be an accredited educational institution, then there's some visas, or you need to be fully qualified with certain degrees for the position you do. So even where Living Social, unless they're doing something special, you're not allowed to hire, you're not allowed to sponsor someone. And so we're not able to take any international students to apprentice, uh, apprentices to Apprentice.io. And so because of that, we are, we're expanding the program to Europe um, you heard over it time. First. So, <laughs> um, so that we can take uh, international. So that's a risk that you're taking. Is there anything that you're afraid to do? That you're like, oh, I want to do it, but I can't? Or you're just fearless? Well, I wanted to take the international students in the US anyway, and we, we've actually Honestly, we, we, we tried to do a couple under, mm -hmm. the, t under the table. You did um, not hear that here. Yeah, you did, you, you did not hear that here yeah. first. Um, but, Jeff, Jeff? Uh, I think our, our thing, and uh, I hope this is an answer, although it's, in, in, it's happening now, is we're, we're trying a public enrollment program. Um, with at, at our long term of five, six months, nobody has done that. And it's very, very expensive. And trying to figure out how that how to make that work for what students. What does public enrollment mean? Like uh, like Code Academy is, where you can pay your own way. Uh -huh. uh, but because the program is going to be two and a half times as long, it costs two and a half right. times as much. And mm -hmm. so, can s what will happen when we say like you're going to get this amazing training and education, but you're going to be paying like a year of college kind of expense? Mm -hmm. like a uh, before stipends and things we're working on like that, it's twenty thousand a person. And that's basically just the instructor. So, like, what what I think we we're clearly well, let, there's, let's, let's there's give more. Jeff a oh, sorry. Moment to answer. Oh no, what? Okay. If you oh, have, quick. I just one thing that's scary that I would love to do, but I'm not sure how to do it yet, is to do beginner focus like computer education for kids. So at like the middle school, high school level, where I think a lot of uh, so I've got two girls. So where a lot of uh, stereotypes get formed. In that middle school, like I'd like to somehow like break through right at that point mm -hmm. and start to open up this kind of literacy and empowerment for all the kids. So that by the time they get to college, they already feel great about where they feel uh, in, in, in respect to technology that they can produce something and not just consume it uh, all, all day and all night. Yeah. And Stephen, do you want to? Um, do you want to? Is there something you'd like to do with your program? Your well. It's not like something that I'm afraid of doing. I think one of the next steps for us is to look at uh, the idea of apprenticing. Well, the team, we, we do a book club, and the team shows us the next book, the apprenticeship patterns that one of the speakers put. Uh, I think Ashish put it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's going to cause us to 
come up with some kind of a plan as to what to try next. So. Um, I'm just going to close with this. You guys can answer in any way you like. Um, are any of you concerned or really trying hard to bring sexy back? <laughs> Anybody? I think it's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in sexy. Thanks very much.